Kids are dismissed to Kids Club. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, the first four verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, that sounds a lot like the beginning of chapter 5. There, he opens chapter 5 by saying, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. For those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross, we have a salvation that is full, final, and complete. So complete that even trials and suffering cannot separate us from our position in Christ. And then he goes on in chapter 5 with the truth that we used to be in Adam. Now we have been joined in living union with Christ and we have a whole new position. He talked about how the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We used to be under the law, now we're under grace. Sin used to rule us, now grace reigns. And then he paused to answer objections in chapter 6 and 7. He answered the objection that his gospel says, well, it's just okay to go ahead and sin. You know, don't worry about it. Salvation's free. He answered that objection. He answered the objection that we will sin if we're not under law. You know, you've got to have rules to control people. And he answered the objection that he's teaching that the law is a bad thing. That's what Paul says. No, he's not. And then he finishes that section, end of chapter 7, by describing the terrible power of sin that works in every person who is, as he says, living in the flesh, who is still in Adam. How the law cannot deliver us in any way, shape, or form, all it can do is lead to a cry of despair. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And having answered that so completely, he returns now to his theme of chapter 5, that our salvation, if we are in Christ, is full, final, and complete. And here's what he says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're following in the King James, it goes on with the end of verse 4 there. That was not the way Paul wrote it in the original manuscripts. It ends with that statement, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. And this is a great summing up of everything that he has had to say about justification, about that climactic moment when you stand before God. What will God say about you? What will he pronounce? Will he pronounce you righteous, fit for the glory, honor, and peace that's for everyone who does good, according to chapter 2, verse 10? Or will he pronounce you unrighteous, deserving the tribulation and distress that comes from the wrath and fury that God has for every human being who does evil. Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. What will he pronounce? There is, folks, no greater question than that. 
Well, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. He will never consign you to tribulation and distress, the outcome of his wrath and fury against sin. That is what condemnation is. He said it in verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The war between us and God is over. And now says the same thing. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only is the Christian not in a state of condemnation, he never can be. And there are many who misunderstand this. And they seem to think that a Christian is a person who confesses their sin, asks forgiveness, and always forgiven. So for the moment, he's not under condemnation. But then he sins. Uh, people do, you know, by act or by thought, he violates God's commands. Now he's under condemnation again. And then he repents, he confesses his sin again, he asks for forgiveness, he's cleansed again. So to them, the Christian is a person who's constantly passing back from one state to the other, back and forth. Condemned, not condemned. But Paul says that is a completely false notion. It completely misunderstands the position of a Christian. When Paul says no here, he does not mean, well, for the time being. No, he means never. There will never be any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, a Christian ought to take sin seriously. As we studied in chapter 6, a Christian must be on their guard not to let sin reign in their mortal body, taking care not to present any of their faculties as an instrument for sin to use. A Christian is to submit the power and reign of grace. But... A Christian should never allow themselves to feel condemned. Should never allow themselves to feel that they've lost their hope and their assurance because they've sinned. The devil trying to get you to feel condemned. He is, after all, called the accuser of the brethren. But a Christian must learn to answer the devil. If the thought comes to you that you're condemned, that you're facing the wrath and fury of God, then you answer with scripture. Here's what you answer. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Memorize that verse. The apostle is asserting here that if we're Christians, your sins and mine, past sins, present sins, future sins, have already been dealt with once and forever. Did you realize that? Many of our troubles come from not realizing that. But when you get to the end of the chapter, he uses the wonderful statement. I can hardly wait to get there. I'm going to read it in time. But as he concludes, you know, what will separate us from the love of Christ? He goes through this list, and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But it's really all right here at the beginning of the chapter. And this is true, not because of what we have done. It's true because of who we are. Who are we? A Christian is one who is in Christ Jesus. So easy to say. In Christ Jesus. But there, there, there's nothing greater than that. We used to be in Adam. Now we're in Christ. It's a whole new position. We were condemned in Adam. We are justified in Christ. As he said, chapter 5, verse 10, for if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we're reconciled, we shall be saved in his life. That's what the same thing, famous verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He made him, that is, God the Father, be God the Son. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. In Christ. We share His death. We looked at that in chapter 6. Now I'm going to read chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And I'm going to do what I did when we studied that passage. I'm going to translate the word baptized. 
And as I pointed out, baptize is a Greek word. It's not an English word. They left it as a Greek word because it would disagree with the theology of many of the Bible translators if they actually translated it. It was baptized, the Greek word baptized, an ordinary household word people use it all the time for non-religious purposes, and it literally means to immerse or to place into. So I'm going to translate it. The only English translation I know of that actually translates this is Dr. Weiss' expanded translation. So, chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, in Christ we shared his death. Do you not know that all of us who have been placed into Christ Jesus were placed into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by this placing into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. When Christ died, I died. When Christ rose, I rose. When Christ ascended, took me with him. There I am, seated with him in the heavenly places. But so many people think, well, Austin, you should talk like this. You can't tell people everything is sure and guaranteed that that's dangerous. No, it's not. It is the person who knows that he is in Christ who is enabled to, as Paul says in chapter 7, serve in the new way of the Spirit. Is the person who knows he's in Christ who is enabled to bear fruit for God. And he begins to explain why this is true in verse 2. Let's look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. He says, for, or because, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. This, this is his first reason for saying that there's no condemnation for the Christian. First, look, look at the verb, the action. What has happened? Has set you free. Now, the verb is in the aorist tense in the Greek. It means an action that has happened already, once and forever. He's not talking about a process in the Christian life. It's happened. We have been set free. Then, look at the phrase at the end. The law of sin and death. Something has set the Christian free, every single Christian, from the law of sin and death. He's not saying, well, it's possible you might become dead to the law of sin and death. No, he says it's true of the Christian, every Christian. All who are in Christ. So what is the law of sin and death? Now, your translation may say, has set you free from the power of sin. And I agree with the overall theology of that, but I don't think that's an accurate rendering of this particular verse. I'm not saying you have a bad translation. I'm saying I think in this verse, by pushing a particular interpretation instead of using Paul's actual words, they kind of miss Paul's point. The Greek word there is the very same word translated law all the way through chapter 6 and 7. And I think, for whatever my opinion is worth, that translating it as power follows an interpretation. What, what, what Paul's doing here is he's giving us a formula for living the Christian life. I don't think it's far off the mark, but I think it misses Paul's point. There, let's see, there are many who teach that, well, chapter 7, Paul is showing the defeated Christian life. So flip the page over to chapter 8. Now Paul is showing us the victorious Christian life, powered by the Holy Spirit. And he does tell us about the work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 8. But I don't think that's what he's doing in the first four verses. What he's doing is he's telling us the position of every Christian. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Every Christian. Why? Because we are set free from the law of sin and death. Every single Christian is. Not just those who learn the secret of the victorious Christian life. So there is and never will be condemnation for anybody who is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because we're set free from the law of sin and death. 
What is the law of sin and death? This is exactly what the law was in chapter 6 and 7. It's the law of God given to humankind, written in the hearts of all people, according to chapter 2, verse 15, and clearly written down in the law given through Moses to the children of Israel. We started out back in chapter 1. The reason for the gospel, for the wrath of God, is revealed from heaven against all of it ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What reveals it? The law. Chapter 3, we read that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, here's the gospel. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness. This is what the law says. It's kind of crystallized in Ezekiel 18.4. The soul who sins will die. Simple. You sin, you die. In just case we miss it, it's repeated again in Ezekiel 18.20. If you sin, you will die physically, spiritually, eternally. And that is completely fair. That is justice. Why? For those who are in Christ Jesus, we are set free from that. What has set us free? The law of the spirit of life. What is that? The law of the spirit of life. I've got the chase to tell you why. I think it's the gospel. There, there are those that say, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian. That's what delivers us from death. But that cannot be what it means here because he goes on to explain in verse 13. He says there that what sets us free is God's justifying work at the cross. So to say we're set free from the law of sin and death by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is essentially the Roman Catholic view. The Roman Catholic view is that we're not under condemnation because God has sanctified us. He's made us better, so we're not condemned. The gospel view is that we are not condemned because Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary. On the cross, he paid the just penalty of all of our sins. And by the declaration of God, when we place our faith in Christ, his perfect righteousness is credited to us. And this happens through faith alone. Faith in Christ and his finished work on the cross. So this phrase, the law of the spirit of life, is just another way of describing the gospel. So why does he say the law of the spirit of life? Well, he did the same thing in chapter 3, verse 26 and 27, where it says that the cross was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? A law of works? No. But by the law of faith. What excludes all boasting is the law or the principle of faith. It's the principle of God's way of salvation through Jesus Christ. Talking about the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 6 through 8. Now listen, he says, God has made us, we who are his bond slaves, sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, that's the law, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, that's the law, if that was glorious, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? The gospel is the ministry of the Spirit there. Paul and Timothy were doing the ministry of the Spirit by preaching the gospel. So verse 2, here in Romans 8, for the principle of the Spirit of life, or the ministry of the Spirit of life, or the covenant of the Spirit of life, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. This is what has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What is this principle, this ministry, this covenant like? 
the principle of the spirit of life. This is what happens when you preach the gospel and people are saved. Because we are in Christ, there is a new life in us. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. So much in Ephesians just parallels what he says in Romans. When we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. Same thing, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, is Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So there is a new life in us, and it's the life of Jesus Christ. How does the life of Jesus Christ come into us? The answer is, by the Holy Spirit. You see this in 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. Christ's body. For by one Spirit we were all baptized. Remember what baptized means? Placed into. By one Spirit we were all placed into one body. He places us into the body of Christ. The work of salvation planned by the Father and carried out by the Son is applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Before we were in Adam, sin ruled us with a slave master's power. Now we've been set free from all of that. We're in a whole new realm. We're in Christ Jesus, living a life in the Spirit, energized by Him. We're not under the law, we're under grace. That's why there can be no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We're not only forgiven, we've been moved into a whole new realm. We're in the realm of Jesus Christ, and that is also the realm of the Spirit. The law condemned us. It became the law of sin and death. But we've been set free by this new ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of glory, the ministry of grace. But the law of the Spirit of life, the principle of the Spirit of life, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Look at verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 3 begins with the word for, just like verse 2. Now your translation might not use Paul's introductory word, but he does say, for God has done what the law could not. Because he's going to explain how the law of the spirit of life sets us free from condemnation. So, let's remind ourselves of Paul's theme. The fundamental statement is in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he explains in verse 2 that not only have we been justified, pronounced righteous, not only have we been forgiven, but we're in Christ. We're in a whole new realm, the realm of the Holy Spirit, living this new life. And so we will understand why God did this the way he did as he explains, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now he has really said this before, in a different way, in chapters, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 7. So what, why does he repeat truth over and over because people don't get it people keep looking to themselves to accomplish life and every Christian needs to be transformed by renewing their minds changing the way they think until they see themselves in Christ with all the truth that goes with that new position what do we need to know? How are we to think? God did it. God did it. Not us. God. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not 
For God has done what the law could not do. Why? It was weakened by the flesh. The, the problem is not the law. We saw that in chapter 7. The law is holy and righteous and good. The problem is us. Sin rules in us. I'm talking about us as human beings. There is a law in our members cracking the slave master's whip and making us captive to the law of sin and death. It makes us cry out, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. So what the law could not do, what I could not do, God did. What did he do? He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law. Philippians 2 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Hebrews 2 14, we looked at that this morning. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. He came in the flesh, but he was not sinful. The angel answered, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. We all looked at 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Father made the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. God sent his Son his Holy Son, to save sinners. Is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners? Paul said, among whom I am foremost of all. Verse 3 again. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. And that means, was condemned, it means exactly what it meant in verse 1. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to the cross, he brought sin before his judgment throne. He passed sentence on it and he punished it. Because God punished our sin in his incarnate son. He can pronounce us righteous. He can look at us as if we had never sinned. And he could do that and still remain just. Paul emphasizes that in chapter 3. He said we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He says it's to show his righteousness. So that he might be just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. Continuing on verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The law has no claim on us. The law demands obedience. Jesus perfect obedience. The law demands punishment. Jesus took that punishment on himself. So, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. It's fulfilled in our justification. Jesus died for us. We place our faith in him. His righteousness credited to us. But the righteous requirement of the law is also Fulfilled in us in our walk. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is a description of what it is to be a Christian, to be in Christ. 
Same thing he was talking about in chapter 7, verses 4 and 6. He said, you died to the law through the body of Christ so that we may be married to Christ in order that we may bear fruit for God. We were, he says, chapter 7, verse 5, living in the flesh, but now we're released so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. You see, if we're in Christ, we are not in the flesh. That's not our realm. We are now on the road to glory. As he will develop further in here in chapter 8, let me just give you verse 29 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's where we're going to end up, folks. Once we're in Christ, the journey begins. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Paul reminds Titus, chapter 2, verse 14, Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. He already told us this, chapter 6, verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be rendered inoperative so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Who are Christians? Christians are people who walk a new way. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You see how Paul opens up a whole new look at what it means to be in Christ as we get into chapter 8. Our, our walk means the life that we live. Now Paul uses that word in Ephesians 2. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world. That was how we walked. That was our life. But it's not our life anymore. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Acts calls Christians the people of the way. They didn't call them Christians. Just that they came up with that word to make fun of them in uh, the city of Antioch. What do they call them? They call them the people of the way. Not walking the broad way that leads to destruction, but the narrow and hard way that leads to life. This is a Christian. Not just some Christians who have gone to some seminar and they learned the secret of the Christian life. No, this is all Christians. Walking according to the Spirit is a different mindset than we had before. And we'll go on to chapter 5 and we'll, we'll study this next week. We are now in Christ. We're in the realm of the Spirit. We have been enlightened by the Spirit. We've been made alive by the Spirit. And as we walk through life, we are being led by the Spirit. That's why Paul tells the Galatians that the secret of the Christian life is not putting yourself back under the law. It's keeping in step with the Spirit. Jesus answered Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born of the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We are in a whole new realm. It's a whole new life to live. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. But God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order 
that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It is God's work. He is at it now. And he will not quit until it is fulfilled. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day for Christ Jesus. Tom, would you read this from Grace by